step behind the camera and welcome to the iPhotography podcast. So it's time for our last episode, but not forever. Yeah. This is just the last episode of our mini series, isn't it, Nick? Yeah. So again, you are with Stephen, if you're listening, and you can also hear the voice of art historian and photographer Nick Hunt, who's been joining me in the past two episodes um, for our discovery through the history of photography. So thank you very, very much for uh, joining us for this last episode of the mini series. Because um, what, what's what's the last bit of then? What's the last bit of this series then, Nick? What are we looking at today exactly? Well, the idea was here was to try and sort of bring in actual photographers uh, that, that that kind of. We kind of did, done it as a timeline, didn't we? So we did the technology uh, in the first uh, first podcast. Second podcast was kind of going through different types and styles of photography as photography developed over the years. And this time we thought it'd be good to just pick out a few uh, photographers as examples of influential people uh whether it's through their photography or what they discovered or invented or what they contributed to photography uh and so we can you know suggest people that you might be interested in in looking at their images i mean we'll, we might talk about some of the images uh that, that that we've selected out which uh but we'll we'll sort of talk about them uh in a way where you don't actually have to see the images as well so if you're listening uh and you're not actually watching um you should should still be able to get plenty out of this podcast. Yeah, exactly. That's it. We try our best to kind of make the uh, make the episode as enjoyable as possible, as you say, whether you're listening uh, as the, as a podcast or you're catching us on yeah. YouTube. We'll, we'll kind of flash some images up on screen at any relevant points based upon who we're talking about. But if you've been listening to any of the previous two episodes, there's a number of photographers I think we'll end up touching on um, who we've mentioned previously. But now yeah. we're looking more about them as a, as a person, um, you know, maybe some little life facts. That's what I've got. I've got a number of different photographers I've been yeah. Uh, searching and and you've been doing the same haven't you yeah i've tried to pick out a few bits and pieces about about them their lives maybe quotes by them Mm. uh and the way they worked and that that kind of thing so you know you don't necessarily have to see the images to 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 benefit from this it's tricky isn't it because we're you know it's a visual medium so you (laughs) you, you know you're kind of thinking you know (laughs) it is quite hard to but we'll we've picked out some images so if you if you are watching it you can see the images um but we'll describe them as well and you may be able to find them you can google them <laughs> this is going to be like a, for, isn't it? it's like a podcast yeah. for pictionary isn't it we're going to end up describing so yeah. there's a picture yeah, of yeah. a man holding a can and this is what it's going to end up like well, we'll try not do too much of that <laughs> but yes indeed so i think if we if we kind of follow a similar suit as we've done previously yeah. we've basically gone back in time uh, i mean in our first episode we went back kind of hundreds yeah. of years but i think now you know if we're going back to around about kind of the 19th century mid 19th yeah. century one yeah, of yeah. our one of the probably most common names that we've brought up in the previous two um yep. episodes is a joseph and we've we've been we've been a little bit unsure on the pronunciation yeah. of this as well joseph nisifor nishi uh, yeah i thought or well, nisifor niepsi i don't know possibly i still haven't figured that one out but he's, he's french though either way so <laughs> yes. to give you in terms of his lifespan he born on yeah. the 7th of march 1765 and died on the 5th of july 1833 yeah um, and he was um he was actually, I think he was quite posh, wasn't he? And he survived the French Revolution mm-hmm. uh, and then joined the Revolutionary Army. But he was always, he studied physics and chemistry originally. And then he got interested in the development of a photo, trying to reproduce images um, by uh, grav- uh, on sort of lithography. Uh, and he wanted to try and find a way because rather than, just reproduce drawings he wanted to try and reproduce real actual images uh which he'd seen uh through uh the use of the uh what you call it the um camera obscura so it was using that technique and trying to reproduce those images kind of physically using physics and chemistry uh and he called it heliography uh, and he, he he also did you know he invented he also invented the internal combustion engine. Really, and no, yeah. I didn't ha- oh, actually, yeah. I did have that note. Apologies, yeah, and I'm not. I'm... I 
I had no idea. <laughs> so the Mongnita 4's other inventions was the, the Pyrella 4. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Think, which is effectively yeah, the name for the combustion engine, yeah. which he conceived, created, and developed with his older brother, uh, older yeah. brother Claude. Yeah. Yeah, and they both worked together on this kind of lithography technique as well, reproducing images automatically. Yeah. Uh, and then eventually, uh, I think his brother sort of opted out and went off to do other things, and he got together with uh, Louis Daguerre, who we're going to talk about next. Indeed. But the, the interesting thing is that Nice for Nips, he, he, the oldest surviving image uh, that we have is by him. I mean, he pro he he actually produced images earlier than this image from 1826, which is a view out of his window. Um, if 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 you know, it's a very blurry image, isn't it? It's, <laughs> it is. It's there's, there's very hard like to make out what's two, going on in there. Two towers, yeah. from what I look like, maybe it's a courtyard he's looking yeah. out towards. Yeah, and there's yeah. two towers either side and yeah. a, a bit of a landscape ahead. But yeah, it is. It's very very kind of um, I say low quality, but yeah. this was taken in. But it's weird, isn't it? It it, it kind of looks quite arty, doesn't it? You it's know, quite nice though. So. It does. It's a nice structure. image. It's quite an arty image, and it isn't. Mm. But it it wasn't really what he was intending. He was trying to sort of get a clear image through his window his first attempts all disappeared because he hadn't figured out how to fix the images and this is the first image that was actually fixed and is still in existence so from 1826 that was the first ever photographic yeah. image well, it's nearly 200 years that, you know, yeah that, that's been around yeah. which is incredible and yeah. i should say you know he, he he went on to create other things with his brother um, and I think kind of maybe what about another about seven years uh, for yeah about seven years later he actually died um, he died of a stroke uh, for, say fifth of July eighteen thirty three yeah, yeah, yeah. financially ruined that his grave in the cemetery uh, was actually financed yeah. by the, by the local you know, council oh, really? municipal um, <clears throat> yeah. municipality uh, yeah. so I think that's effectively yeah, yeah, yeah like the council basically kind of paid for them what would well, have been a pauper's funeral. Yeah, but interestingly enough, his house apparently has been uh, restored and reconstructed and is now yeah. a museum of yeah. uh, photography. So, and I think that's something that, well, a, is it somewhere in Grasse or somewhere south of France? So, yeah, I didn't I have guess. the location, but yeah, I know he's, I know he's but, French. Uh, but it's also a museum about him and Louis Daguerre because the second person we photographer we're going to uh, bring up now is uh, Louis Jacques Mondet Laguerre to give him his full name. Wow, I did not have the full title. <laughs> no, I didn't famous. either. So, so I'm learning <laughs> things by doing this. Um, but he he went into partnership with uh, Nisifor Niepce, and now Daguerre. Gare's background was in theatrical. Um, he he did um, stage design for the Paris Opera. Uh, that was his first job, which apparently started when he was 16. And he developed all sorts of fancy tricks, you know, on the stage, you know, with lighting and sort of shadows and uh, big uh, sort of dioramas and things like that. And yeah. then he, he, he then worked on inventing this thing called a diorama with a guy called Charles Bouton, which was basically just a gigantic revolving room, um, which the audience stood in the middle of or sat in the middle of. And I think, you know, you could fit a few hundred people into it. And it had these huge, great revolving scenes that could then be sort of partially animated and lit. So it created these kind of animated, it was this huge, great, and it, they used the camera obscura to help sort of uh, create the dioramas. So the di dioramas were sort of painted, obviously, and transparent and used, you know, light and lenses and all sorts of stuff for all these tricks. So he was kind of a showman in that sense. But that's where he got his in interest in uh, the camera obscura to create the dioramas, which then led on to him getting together with Niepce, because apparently they both used the same um, the, the guy that supplied the camera obscuras came from the same guy and that's where they met. Mm -hmm. So that's when they got together and started working on the process, which eventually got uh, patented as a daguerreotype. It was originally uh, Niepce's heliograph, but he died before it was patented, didn't he? So uh, it was it, yeah. 
yeah. Like, yeah, renamed it after himself. Like, well, that, bit... that's it. It's almost kind of, <laughs> it sounds like he's stolen it a little bit yeah. in a way because they yeah. did have, you know, that 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 period of collaboration, yeah. and it, it pretty yeah. much proved to be fairly fruitless. Yeah. And then yeah. uh, Nishi oh. Nifisher, I'm never going to pronounce that name. No, correctly. no, no. Um, oh, no so like... he died in what 1833, and then about yeah. another six, seven years later on, yeah. that's when Daguerre basically had. Oh, to a degree, perfected his daguerreotype, which he was then calling it. And then he yeah. basically went and gave it to the French government. But I didn't realize yeah. he actually bargained with them. Um, oh, really? So, yeah. So yeah. This, the story behind it goes is that he was he was basically going to give the uh, the patent to the French government and then basically declare it as a, a free gift from France to the world. Ah, but in okay. exchange, he'd asked for a lifetime pension for himself Ooh. and Nisha yeah. Four's son, Isidore. Yeah. So <laughs> basically, yeah. yeah. So even though... Um, Nishi had died uh, a kind of six, seven years previous. Yeah. He basically bargained to make sure he got oh, a wow. lifetime pension for himself and Nisha's uh, son, so that they both kind of financially benefited. Oh, from well, it that's from nice because at least he, he may have named it after himself, but it did, uh, you know, sort of make sure that his son was looked after yeah. uh, from the process that he'd helped develop. And yeah. um, the, the images, I mean, again, Louis Daguerre is not particularly famous as a photographer. He's more famous as the inventor of the daguerreotype. But if you see that, like one of his first images, he was. He, he, he obviously the, the way it works the, the, right at the beginning it tended to be just objects and still lives and scenes because the exposures were so long so uh, he photographed like still lives in his studio which give a sense you, you can tell that he was an arty kind of you know creative person because of all the objects in his studio and he'd arrange them and photograph them uh in the in those first uh images that that he showed showed the world which were you know some of the the, the the first sort of clear images where you could actually see clearly and they they, they are pretty good actually when you think mm. about you know how long ago they were made and that it was such a new process much much better than those original heliographs by Nietzsche so yeah. uh, the, you know they weren't the first images but they were much clearer and that you know they, 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 they sort of compare quite favorably to images that were taken you know in the 20th century really well Just that's it looking at the ones that that we've got from you know what from what you've done on your research of together yeah. if you compare them to, to Nietzsche's ones kind of going back um what's probably about nine years difference between the two there is a remarkable standard of of images and nowadays people yeah you know, in, in certain maybe sub genres of photography they try and go out to take those kind of low grade type of you know vintage looking shots yeah. so it's it's still kind of popular amongst some people but yeah it's it's an image that you know you wouldn't necessarily date as far back as as nearly 200 years it's quite remarkable what he's no doing. well you see people i mean there's so, like, like now with photoshop there's filters that give you that instant effect isn't it so <laughs> yeah. you, you can go onto photoshop take a shot on your digital camera and make it look like an old daguerreotype exactly. just by clicking a button which is <laughs> quite was... funny really isn't it i also read he was quite a competitive um individual yeah as well. i can but imagine yeah. there was there was one um kind of little anecdote that i that i read at the end of his his bio that Basically, his his agent, a gentleman called Miles Berry, had applied for a British patent of the Daguerre type literally days yeah. before um, Daguerre went to the French government and declared it free to the world. So what yeah. that effectively did is that everybody in the world had a license to be able to use the Daguerre type and copy yeah. the idea yeah. apart from the British. And that is simply because <laughs> of, I think, the next person we're going to talk yes. about, Mr. Yeah. Henry Fox Talbot. Yes. Yeah. William Henry Fox Talbot, who was uh, developing a totally different process, but at roughly the same time. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because he uh, he invented the color type, which is a negative. So the color type negative and the salted paper print, which you had to use together. So you could actually re reproduce those. So you had a negative and positive process, whereas Daguerre's was direct positive and you couldn't reproduce them. They were just, it was just one image and that was it. So although Henry Fox Talbot's images had the advantage of being reproducible, but they weren't anywhere near as sharp as the daguerreotypes. They were much softer, sort of blurrier images, but they were reproducible and they were a lot cheaper to make as well and easier to make. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, but when he heard, so it, it was when um, Fox Talbot heard about uh, Daguerre's, um, you know, announcements in France, he quickly 
uh, announced his own invention and asserted priority because he'd actually uh, he'd he'd actually been you know creating images. He said earlier, uh, but he just hadn't announced them because he was still sort of yeah. It's I like, love that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I knew how to do this. I knew how to do this. <laughs> I just I just got to put it in the newspaper yeah. because yeah. I mean, he was maybe a little mm. bit more conservative than Daguerre in the sense that obviously Daguerre went out and basically gave the world photography. Yeah. Whereas Fox Talbot, um, so he, he developed the idea for the, for the color type and then he went yeah. out and sold individual pattern licenses yeah. for at the time, 20 pounds a piece. Yeah. Um, and then he lowered the fee if you were an amateur photographer to four pounds. Um, but professional photographers had to pay up to 300 pounds annually. And that's I a even, lot of money, isn't it? Well, I even went into the lengths of actually finding out what that equivalent is oh, today. Really? Okay. and that's six and a half thousand pounds in what? today's money so you've got to pay wow. six and a half grand to basically be able to use the camera Blimey. itself to use it to, you know, to take the patent uh, yeah. and to kind of have the license so yeah he was um you know in a business climate a lot of people you yeah. know he, he made a lot of money um and he was and i thought criticized for it <laughs> yeah and i thought photoshop was expensive you know <laughs> when, when that came out i was like oh i can't afford photoshop it's way too much money and you think but it wasn't six thousand pounds six and a half year. grand <laughs> that's it Gosh. i imagine just paying six and a half thousand yeah. pounds to be able i to had no idea Canon camera these days is it's, it's absolutely yeah. well i say it sounds crazy but even paying yeah. four pounds um a year as well that probably would have been a lot to, yeah. to people yeah. back then as well and this is why you could possibly understand at that time as we've said previously why oh, photography yeah. was more sought after at these early stages by the rich yeah and uh he i mean the other thing he's known for is he published the first photographic book because obviously you couldn't publish a book of daguerreotypes because they were metal you know they were metal mm -hmm. and they weren't reproducible uh so the pencil of nature which was published, I think, in 1844 or between 1844 and 86. I think it was published in in in, in sort of installments, um, and they were obviously prints, but the prints had to be individually printed and then uh, stuck into the book. So it was a book. So each print was made. So it was like a, a book of photographic prints, basically, because they couldn't be reproduced uh, mechanically like they can nowadays. So yeah. they had to, each one had to be individually printed uh, and mounted inside the book. But that was the first uh, ever photographic book. And a, a lot of the images, I mean, I just pulled out one like, like the haystack. Um, he photographed a lot of I mean, basically, he, he was based, I think, in uh, Laycock Abbey, which is on the Isle of Wight, isn't it? And uh, which is also a museum now. And everything uh, he photographed, he, he just photographed things around in the countryside. You know, people that worked on the estate, um, ladders up against walls, haystacks, just mm -hmm. objects. Um, they're quite soft, aren't they? They're very soft and sort of they've they got are. a brown tone to them. They're very... They're very sort of, uh, you know, quite ethereal images, aren't they? Which quite, I think yeah. they've got a lovely quality to them. In comparison to like a daguerreotype, it, it's quite low contrast, you would say. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It's quite flat. I mean, he was, um, just just as a, as a point of call, um, I made a little note about Laycock Abbey is actually near Chippingham uh, or Chippenham in Wiltshire. Oh, is it? Oh, Wiltshire. Yeah. Sorry, I've got that Wiltshire. wrong. So oh, I'm getting a mixed up. I know, uh, Julie Margaret Cameron, she was the Isle of Wight one. I was getting uh, the two mixed up. But I believe there was a, yeah. a there was a good bone in his body in the sense that though he was charging yeah. basically through the nose for people to use the pattern and the license of the the color type because he was quite fond and keen on f uh, photography or color type basic being used to record um, things like florals, flowers, plants, buildings, landscapes. He actually allowed the color type to be used for free under license only for scientific uh, use. So yeah. if you if you were you know yeah. scientists you know documenting yeah. something and I think maybe this is probably where the photo book came in useful that you started to create yeah. these almanacs and these these uh, encyclopedias yeah and um, that became kind of quite useful already so there was a little yeah. bit of a loophole in his business. I think it's he's interesting as well because he did he saw the artistic potential of photography as well so they were you know he saw it as a means of capturing the beauty of nature but presenting it in an artistic way as well whereas with the daguerreotype it got quickly taken out it was more it was like the portraits wasn't it it was yeah. like to you know for that's 
pretty much all it was used for. I mean, I think people use the Gotarts for landscapes and things like that as well. But he saw the artistic potential of photography, which was then uh, sort of taken forward by other photographers, uh, which leads us into Julia Margaret Cameron, because she was, I mean, she was a portrait photographer, mm. but she was very concerned with the artistic potential of photography rather than it just reproducing something. So she's yeah. very anti the, the sort of daguerreotype sort of stiffly posed portrait that, 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 was, that was very popular. Mm. Um, but she didn't want to do things in that way. And she got heavily criticized for it. I mean, she, she, did, she didn't take up photography until she was um, 48 years old when she was given she was given a camera as a gift by her daughter just to give her something to do I think because she was <laughs> kind of like uh, she'd had loads of kids by then and I guess she oh, retired right. from retired from having <laughs> children and was uh, you know stuck at home in in uh, the Isle of Wight probably you know bored <laughs> <laughs> say, literally isolated Give, on an island yeah yeah although she had job. lots of now she, the thing is with her she she was very artistic and she was very religious as well and she, she was good friends with a lot of famous kind of literary and artistic people in Victorian England as well so she started basically taking photographs of of her friends which who just happened to be famous people like Charles Darwin and Alfred Lord Tennyson and George Frederick Watts and people like that so mm. uh, she had access to very famous people um, but she got heavily criticized now I've got some quotes here and uh, that, that, that so she, she also sort of posed people as biblical historical and allegorical stories so they were quite sort of uh, influenced by um, the artists and the, the poets of the time as well and but her photographs it's a broke the rules they were intentionally out of focus including scratches smudges and other traces of the process and so it but she did it on purpose she wanted the images to be creative and the, she wanted to bring something out that, that was unique to photography now other people thought the uniqueness of photography was about it you know being able to completely capture nature exactly as it was yeah. whereas for her the uniqueness of photography i think was more to do with the the process and the printing and the the inherent characteristics and the, the, the you know the things that that weren't sort of just true to nature so she liked the fact that it was a bit of movement so people couldn't sit still for, for long enough and apparently the, you know on some of the sittings I was reading something about they were um, you know having to sit still for a number of minutes for one of her portraits mm. uh, and the guy was saying that he had to, he had to sit you know in this pose with a crown on his head and sort of try and keep this keep this kind of uh, <laughs> sort of arty pose for about five minutes and he said the, the crown started slipping on his head and oh. he was trying not to laugh and apparently her husband used to sort of hang around with them as well and he was prone to having hysterical fits of giggling while they were doing it really so it helpful. sounds like yeah <laughs> so he said there's julia margaret cameron's husband they're giggling in the corner while this guy's got his crown slipping off his head and they're all trying to be very serious and it sounds like they had quite a laugh doing it so when well, you look at the it. so it's, it's, sort of it's looking nice. at the images yeah it, it's nice to get a sense of how they did it but yeah, she was criticised. Apparently, one of the one of the I've got a quote here. Mrs. Cameron exhibits her series of out of focus portraits of celebrities. We must give this lady credit for daring originality, but at the expense of all other photographic qualities. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So basically, so, yeah, there's a kind of a, a pat on the back then with a knife going into it yeah. at the same time. Yeah. But it, it's <laughs> it's nice that she's like one of the first people that has seen the medium as an artistic form you know yeah. you know alongside yeah, yeah. painting and, and sculpture etc yeah. at the time she's seen the the opportunity yeah. whereas beforehand yeah. we've been talking about uh Nietzsche and Fox Talbot and Daguerre literally well somewhat saw it as a money-making business for some yeah. but yeah, others yeah. just saw it as a very much a process of recreating yeah. what was seen she yeah. you know she was probably one of the first people you know that quite influential people to see the the benefits of being able to manipulate things you know add a little bit of focus blur nothing nothing 
and ever needed yeah. to be perfect. Yeah. It was about the emotion within the shot, wasn't it? Yeah, and the, 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 like the image that I picked is uh, it's actually a picture of Alice Little, who was the inspiration for Alice in Wonderland, oh, wow. and because she was uh, friends with Lewis Carroll as well, mm-hmm. and uh, you know they, it was just somebody amongst it, and she photographed her quite a lot and got her posed and dressed up. So this one's dressed up as. Pomona. Uh, I don't know if that's a Shakespearean camera. I didn't actually look into that a Shakespearean character or sounds, sounds somebody like from poetry name. or Shakespeare. Yeah. yeah. So she'd pose at this little quite often. Uh, so she was one of her, you know, sort of uh, people that she worked with quite a lot. So you see a lot of the uh, people in her portraits, particularly these allegorical or the ones where they're dressed up, they tend to be her friends and family, mm. whereas the serious portraits tend to be of the the famous artists and poets. And yeah, sort of other she obviously she moved in, in decent circles, yeah. which again reinforces oh, yeah. the idea of photography at this point anyway being in, in the higher classes, really. And it would have given her access to, you know, exhibiting her work and getting it seen as well which a lot of people oh, yeah. you know i mean you had to you still had to have money then and it was a difficult process i mean it was quite a dangerous process because she used the collodion wet plate process where you could quite easily set fire to yourself or blow up your studio oh, definitely yeah but again you know mm. it, it's like so we, she's we quite brave as well <laughs> that the, there needs to be money and backing that yeah. goes into a lot of yeah. this uh, and it, and a lot of it is uh, like we've talked a yeah. couple of times also like with with um nishi and daguerre type uh, yeah. type daguerre um it's who you know um not yeah. so much what you know not that they weren't yeah. great photographers yeah. But it's that they were able to connect in those little small yeah. worlds, and it, yeah. it still goes on today. That a lot of people say, you know, photography kind of getting getting in front in photography. A lot of it is who you know, and yeah. you're moving in those circles. And yeah, you're absolutely. The right way. So yeah. started off hundreds, you know, a long time ago. Yeah. Anyway, um, but yeah. So so moving on from um, Julia Margaret Cameron. Um, another person that I had of note around about a similar time, maybe a little bit later coming in. Um, had Imogen, Cumming- I- Imogen Cunningham, but I also know that Peter Henry Emerson is somebody that um, of, qu- of quite big note that you want to talk yeah, about. Yeah, uh, I'll just bring him in quickly because I think he he was a founder member of a group called Linked Ring, and they were the first kind of group of uh, photographers who set up their own gallery to exhibit their own work as, as artistic photographers and wanted to promote uh, photography as, as an artistic medium in its own right and his ideas were that he he wasn't quite as um experimental maybe as julia margaret cameron but his idea his kind of way of working kind of led on to to 20th century photography i would say because it was the Mm -hmm. idea that um when you're using a camera uh it was the idea of using a sort of differential um, focus. So depth of field came into it for the first time, which he did purposely because his idea was that when you look at something uh, with your eyes, you, you you look at something and there's something in your center of vision that you're looking at. And then what's around it and in the background, it's not necessarily blurred because you can then look at the background with your eyes. So you can move your eyes around a scene, can't you? But when you actually look at something, there's one central thing that you're looking at and everything else becomes sort of, you know, sort of peripheral to it or blurred. And that's that's the way he worked with his photographs. And he wanted to photograph actual real people. So he was one of the first, I'd say, sort of um, documentary photographers. And he documented uh, the workers in the landscape around him in the fields and in the countryside. So he was quite, um, that that was quite a, a yeah. new thing to do as well. So, and they're, they're very beautifully uh, put together photograph. I mean, they're beautifully composed. Uh, if, if you look at any of his images, I mean, I just picked a random one of somebody uh, rowing a boat full of, uh, it's on the Norfolk Broads and he photographed a lot oh. of people working on the Norfolk Broads. Yeah. And it's it's called Rowing Home, the, the Shoof Stuff. I have no idea what the Shoof <laughs> Stuff the is, shoof but stuff it, is. it looks like a big pile of reeds. So I think it, it does, might be yeah. stuff that are used for, for thatching or something. Quite possibly, but, yeah. Very possible, um, no. And they were... They were platinum prints as well. Uh, so he was, uh, he, again, a pioneer of platinum printing and different printing methods. And this is something that was taken up by um, the, the next photographer that I wanted to talk about, which is Edward Steichen, who is probably, I've always thought, one of the most important photographers, really, of the late, well, early 20th century, uh, because he... he 
again, he took up this, it, it was the idea of photography being a creative medium. So he promoted the idea of using different printing techniques as well. So by that time, there, there were lots of other printing techniques like platinum printing, gum bichromate printing, uh, cyanotype printing color type printing lots of different ways to print which each had a impact on the image and you can manipulate those prints so it was getting more although you know nothing like photoshop obviously but this discovery of lots and lots of different ways of creating images mm -hmm. you know from an original negative and it was it that you know obviously by this time this was early 20th century around you know 1900 onwards of uh, there was this whole group of people and in America, it led to another group called the Photo Session and they did the same thing as the Linked Ring where they set up their own gallery space in New York and exhibited yeah. their own photos. And this is, you know, and it led to, you know, I always think that, you know, the photography of the 20th century. So when it was all based around the negative to the print and presented as art, you know, framed on a wall. And they also developed um, photogravures around that time. So you could actually get a very high quality print in a book. So you could have a run of photogravures and they published books uh, called Camera Work, I think in America, which was uh, Alfred Stieglitz, who was a contemporary of Edward Steichen and they worked together as well. So Edward Steichen was kind of the link, I think, to all these photos. And he was also one of the first commercial fashion photographers as well um and celebrity photographers so that's when fashion and celebrity came in yeah and they were able to sort of reproduce these images in magazines and things like that so things moved on very quickly then at the beginning of the 20th century so we had a very slow period with very few photographers but then by the early 20th century there were a, a, an awful lot of people so the edward steichen I picked out a picture of it's a moonrise over a pond and it's a it's through the woods and it's very very atmospheric I think the whole <clears throat> the way they worked it was the idea of creating atmosphere in your photos and uh, not necessarily just reproducing what you see but yeah. manipulating the print and the process so you had something you came up with something very different to what was actually in front of you when you took the photo the result the end result was a, as a was a piece of art that you could put on the wall very much like people work with photoshop these days so. well that's it you know it's an expansion from from yeah. julia margaret cameron as we talked about before her bringing in emotion and you know and humor etc or characters and a story into the image and as you say now now it's continuing on and people are working with light, manipulating color um, or tones more so to bring in atmosphere to, yeah, to images. Yeah, yeah. And, and also, you know, a couple of points that you mentioned with, uh, with Emerson and Steichen and Steiglitz is that they were forming communities of yeah. photographers. Now it's becoming more yeah. and more popular um, around about the early part of the 20th century that, yeah. As you say, secession was starting up. Um, and then another person that I wanted to come on to, we mentioned briefly before, Imogen Cunningham. She was one of the founding yeah. members yeah, yeah. Of, a, of a very popular photography group that's still really, I suppose, in its principles exists today. Yes. Um, known as Group F64, yeah. um, of which another member we will come to in a short while. Um, but to come on to Cunningham, she was born 1883 um, and an American photographer, very much more so known for her diversity in botanics, nudes, uh, industrial landscapes. And apparently, interesting fact, Cunningham was named Imogen after the heroine of Shakespeare's play, Cymbeline or Cymeline. Oh, right. Okay. So that's, where she, that's where her name comes from. There we um, go. It's Imogen. So, but yeah, she was, um, she was a member of um, Group <clears throat> F64, uh, yeah. which California-based uh, photography group, including Ansel Adams, as we'll come on to shortly, um, yeah. who were very, very much focused upon the idea of everything very much being as sharp and as clear yeah. and as simple as possible. Hence well, it was a name. reaction, wasn't it? I mean, this is the thing, you, you kind of think it's the same with art, isn't it? Each movement is a reaction to the movement that came before. So the uh, photo session, they were a reaction against the, the sort of Royal Photographic Society, uh, who were, you know, earlier, they were interested in reproducing really, really sort of clear sort of scenes. And then you've got the, the, the more creative uh, photographers that came after that. And then, like you say, with the F64, it was a reaction against the link ring and the photo session. It was like they didn't want to do yeah. wishy-washy sort of prints. They didn't want to use, uh, you know, weird processes. They didn't want to manipulate their prints. They, they were very concerned with the photography as being it, what it could do and that 
you know, their, their prints were very, like you say, very clear. Everything was in focus. They're very sharp. I mean, but they used, I mean, Imogen Cunningham, actually, she developed um, the platinum print as well. So although though they were, you know, she took it in a different way. So instead of using it to create sort of uh, more sort of like, like um, you know, misty sort of atmospherics like Emerson mm. did, hers were much clearer, sharper, uh, and she was, uh, though, 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 that series that she did of the magnolia blossoms uh they're all platinum prints and it gives them that sort of very sort of clear sort of clean sort of uh quality which um i mean if you've ever seen a platinum print they they are they are quite special it's hard to sort of describe because when you see something reproduced on screen or even in a book you don't get the quality no. and one of the things that really got me into photography in the first place was going to uh an exhibition that that went through the whole history of photography so you got to see all these original prints from different eras by different well-known photographers and seeing the prints some of them you know, they're, they're quite extraordinary to look at and you can understand why you know what they were doing why they were presenting it as art and you kind of miss out on that you you can see the images quite easily obviously on google you can google anything now and see it on screen but you kind of miss out on the actual quality and it was like i was looking at some some books of mine as well uh, i was going through some stuff and i've got some books that have got gravure prints in them and mm -hmm. the gravure prints are absolutely gorgeous i mean it's yeah. you know it's not photography as we we kind of think of it now but it's still it's it's you know it's a photographic medium i think the gravure and a lot of um uh high quality books which were published even up until the um 1980s and 1990s were done using reviewers uh i don't think anybody even probably doesn't even do that anymore do they i don't know if there's I, I a market think... for it anymore well that's it really you know the the the, the age of the <clears throat> internet very much has taken yeah. over for everything to be yeah. know, digitized that i think there's a large degree it's even expanded into into cinematography and, and, and making movies yeah. that yeah, yeah. There, there's still only a few people that would ever shoot on film because they do love that that kind yeah. of textural you know, uh, yeah. you know kind of uh the quality uh, of the actual film itself and that was something that Imogen Cunningham was was extremely kind of yeah. uh, a big fan of, and she she was always quite the the academic individual. She spent a yeah. lot of time working in universities. I think it was the University of yes. Washington in, in Seattle, um, yeah. that she basically wanted to study chemistry or, or study the yeah. chemistry behind photography. And so what she did to pay for her tuition was she approached the botany department and basically said, I, I will take the photographs of, you know, all your, your yeah. plant work yeah, in yeah. There to basically trade off for, yeah. Her, yeah. Um, for her tuition fees as well. Yeah. She, she loved it so much. But yeah, she was very analytical yeah. in that approach. Well, that, that links to one of the other photographers we we're looking at, um, Karl Blosfeld, who was a German photographer, and his images, he, he specialised, he was a botanist, and he specialised in close-up, very clear, clean, close-up black and white images of the forms of plants like seed pods and leaves and flowers and buds and things in black and white, very illustrative, uh, but they're absolutely beautiful. And his, although he wasn't, he wasn't doing it particularly as a, as a, as an arty photographer, he was doing it more from a scientific perspective. Uh, and he published books of these plant forms. Uh, one of them is called the Wonder Garden of Nature and Archetypal Forms. And they were really influential in the 1920s because other, other sort of photographers and artists in Europe were seeing them. And they were sort of developing in parallel, really, with F64, but they called it um, the new, new objectivity. And they photographed industrial objects and also they started experimenting with different viewpoints, looking at things from different angles. So you, you were being creative into an, an abstraction in photography and people like Man Ray uh, doing the first um, sort of uh, what he called rayographs, wasn't it, or rayograms. Uh, so there was so much experimentation going on at the time, which I, you know, I think it's a very exciting period in photography, the twenties and thirties, because there was yeah. so much going on, so many different ways People were just experimenting with different ways of seeing, but it was all to do with photography, pure photography. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was still to do, you know, it was just your, 
you, you know, your negative and your print, uh, not much manipulation afterwards. All the manipulation, if you like, was done in camera then. So the idea was that everything you did yeah. was to do with the actual photographic process, which is another thing that uh, Ansel Adams developed, wasn't it? The zone system to get yeah. all, all the black, all, all your, all, all your t the full tonal range into an image. So it became much more... Um, much more to do with the process and it was the gelatin silver process and that type of print because there wasn't really any other way of doing it if you're working mm. in black and white well and yeah it, exactly there was there was these kind of two schools of thought or approach to photography as you know we've mentioned across a number yeah. of people that <clears throat> some were looking at this very analytically uh, and very much yeah. like a, a scientific study whereas there was others you know a you know a, a uh, another kind of grouping of people um, through things like the Dada and surrealism yeah. who've actually like kind of Mam Ray, as you were talking about, who were yeah. looking at it, you know, exploiting yeah. and pushing the creative boundaries. Because uh, Mam Ray is a, is a very kind of influential figure, um, I think, kind of um, yeah. Yeah, early yeah. early twentieth century. That um, I've always I've always wondered, you know, was, was that his birth name? Was that you know his his given name or as a nickname? So I did a little bit did of I... digging on it. Okay, um, and what so, did you find? Man's, Man Ray's birth name was Emmanuel Radnitsky. So he was uh, okay. He was born South Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So he's American, but he was the eldest uh, eldest child of Russian Jewish immigrants. Yeah. And so Radzinski's family changed their surname to Ray, I think, as they kind of adopted more Western culture. Yeah. And Man Ray's brother chose the surname in reaction to ethnic um, discrimination and anti Semitism. So that surname, Radzinski, it sounds very Eastern European. So yeah. I think they yeah, yeah, sure. changed it to protect themselves. Yeah. Um, so a Man Ray, whose first name was Emmanuel, a lot of the time people called him Manny. And then Manny graduated to Man and therefore became Man Ray. Oh, uh, okay. So it's kind of quite interesting. Yeah, to it's given name. also interesting. You, you're mentioning things to do with anti-Semitism and stuff like that. I mean, that the, the wars, both wars had a huge impact on photography because a lot of uh, European photographers are, uh, ended up either being exiled or leaving for their own safety. So they're all fleeing Europe and going to America. Mm. So a lot of what we think of uh, American photographers uh, had their origins in Europe. And a lot of uh, there was a big influence. So if those artistic scenes in like Paris and Berlin sort mm -hmm. of then came over to America and influenced the you know photography in New York. So you had yeah. a big sort of crossover. Uh, well, that's what Man Ray had done himself. He, he yeah. spent the the twenties, very early thirties, working in Paris, yeah. and yeah. then war had basically chased him out. Then forties yeah. to fifties, yeah. he didn't. He then yeah. went back to Los Angeles and yeah. then returned to Paris again, but only yeah. only when it was safe in the fifties, early fifties. I mean, another photographer that I was really interested in, uh, who's probably one of my all time favorite photographers. Uh, was August Sander, who was a German photographer uh, photographing in the 1930s and 40s. And he embarked on a project where he wanted to photograph and document all the people that lived in Germany at that time, all different types of people, different trades. It was almost like, and he, again, he was kind of one of these um, new, object, new objectivity photographers, a bit like F64. They were just very straightforward. He just found people in their natural environment. He went and photographed workers where they worked with the tools of their trade, mm -hmm. uh, people uh, at weddings, people. But they're, they're beautifully, um, beautifully sort of, I, I don't know, there's just something very compelling about his images. People, they, they tend to, they look straight at the camera uh they, they're very modern looking images mm -hmm. he was um heavily uh, criticized in the end by the nazis because they didn't like the fact that he photographed uh you know uh, gypsies and he photographed circus performers he photographed yeah. uh disabled people he photographed all you know he photographed of homosexuals you know he photographed all these people and obviously he photographed a lot of jewish people as well so it was like he was presenting a whole picture of germany yeah. that was completely not what the nazis wanted to project they wanted no. to project this aryan sort of you know sort of community here it's there in germany a thing to do given so yeah time, isn't he? Quite so he thing. so a lot of his uh, images were destroyed and he was banned from taking those sort of photographs. So in the end, all he could do was take it. it so he spent the last few years of his life, I think, taking landscape photographs during the war. 
uh, because he was, and then documenting uh, the aftermath of the war, because I think he was based um, in Cologne and his studio was bombed. So much of his work was lost. I mean, it's amazing how much of it survives, really, because yeah. I think a lot of it was lost in a bombing raid. And then later on, uh, there was a fire in his studio, which destroyed a lot of his negatives. The Nazis destroyed all his negatives of that of the the project that he was working on but i think he'd already published the book so there were plenty of prints available so that he, he printed everything and published yeah. it so all that work is available and um yeah that, that, that i think that it's an extraordinary body of work and there's some they, they, they look very modern still and i think anybody who's interested in uh, portrait photography particularly if um you know portraits out on location it's mm -hmm. well worth having a look at august sander's work well another gentleman that will um that was kind of arising at the same time which i think probably you know a lot of people will have heard of in some manner or form who again kind of spread his work into portrait photography and especially kind of out on the streets is uh, henry cartier bresson yeah. Um, so he's very, very much known for his um, his, his work on the decisive moment, uh, which was a lot of people say a very influential photography book or probably the most influential yeah. photography book, um, if you agree. But he was um, so obviously he's like French photographer born in Chanteloup. Uh, I'm not going to pronounce the rest of it because I'm not 100% <laughs> sure of my French, but Chanteloup on son et man. I, I'm not okay. sure if that's in Paris, etc. I'll I'm let not 100% <laughs> sure on that as well. Um, but yeah, very much, you know, he was his fascination with, with painting, which a lot of photographers are and, and, and were kind of back then, you know, took inspiration from it. And um, particularly with surrealism, that was one of his big yeah. um, founding, you know, loves, wasn't it? Yes, yeah. Uh, it, it, it was finding that sort of uh, surreal moments in real life as well, isn't it? You kind of think a lot of his images, uh, the one that I picked out was somebody uh, just jumping across a i think a big puddle or something so you're seeing the their reflection in the puddle and it's a weird angle and it's not you know you look at it and you think it's not particularly well composed or anything but it's just a really compelling image mm -hmm. and he was able to go out with uh because by then they developed the small leica cameras so yes. once he once he discovered the leica it was something he could go out with i think did he paint it black so that it made him even more or um, am I, I thinking know. of somebody else? No, it'd be kind of quite but, an interesting fact, though. But yeah, yes, he was a. He was yes, a, he, he was did. Like just, a... Yeah, he enhanced. Yeah, yeah. I've got, I've got my notes here. He did paint it black. Okay. So he painted his little Leica camera black. So that, and I think then Leica copied that later on because they they, they introduced <laughs> black cameras. Yeah. Uh, so he was even more invisible. So it was the idea that you just wandered around the streets as this kind of invisible person with a with a little black camera looking for interesting things to photograph. And this idea of the decisive moment where you snap your shutter at exactly the right time to capture something that's happening that, that, that you wouldn't, you know, necessarily, it, it, it's kind of transforming for me. It was always, it's almost like the idea of trans, that, that, that your camera can transform something, that you, you're capturing something and turning it into something that wasn't actually there, if you see what I mean. You, you kind of, it, it's such a, simple creative process i think it, it just always on the lookout for something and if you get if you get it at the right moment you suddenly you've got this you know you've captured this thing and you've turned it into a piece of art sort of with your camera exactly and continuing on the the theme of networking in the world of photography um cartier bresson he wasn't immune to that himself that the story goes that in 1934 he met a young polish photographer a gentleman called david sisman sisman i think is pronunciation mm -hmm. um but i i think it was a case that cartier bresson couldn't necessarily pronounce his name correctly um so they called him chim um, just as a nickname <laughs> or whether that was David's yeah. kind of nickname already. Yeah. And the two of them um, basically kind of went on for, for a number of years, kind of working together. I think he was also called David Seymour at a later point, but effectively Chim um, was the guy that Cartier-Bresson was effectively uh, introduced to a gentleman called Andre Friedman, who later changed his name. Do you know what name he changed to? Ooh. On, on, I think it's pronounced Andre. It's, it's not, it's E-N-D-R-E, Andre Friedman. No, I don't. Which one? 
later changed his name to Robert Kappa. Oh, it is Robert. I was I had Robert Kappa in my mind because uh. I think he, you were you were going in the direction of Magnum, and I thought, yeah, yes. well, he found him Magnum, <laughs> and he this found is him Magnum where, yeah. with Robert Kappa. But I didn't know. I didn't know that. I didn't and know that's that. it. Yeah, Kappa, previously. George Roger, and yeah, David. Chim- okay. Chim yeah. Seymour. Let's call him uh, Rob yeah. William Vandiver, um, and Cartier Brass on the founder members in 1947 of Magnum Photos. Yeah, and that's another very important point in photography, isn't it? Because then you've got this big association of photographers Mm -hmm. who are all professional photographers. And it was the idea, but it was a a kind of uh, invitation-only group, wasn't it? So you had to sort of like get spotted and then invited to join them. But it was also non-profit, wasn't it? So it wasn't an agency because I think there were photographic agencies that already existed. But I think they were the first one that was, it was purely for the photographers and run by photographers to promote their own work and it was it wasn't an agent that was you know going out there looking for work for you it was done by the photographers and it's become or it did become the the most you know influential group of photographers in particularly in photojournalism wasn't it yeah i, I that's it it's still in existence today um yeah you know, and magnum i think maybe is an agency yeah um more so these days but yeah it was very yeah. much and, and still today i think seen as the elite yeah. i think you know to be referred to as a magnum agency photographer as much as a national geographic photographer i think that they're held held in very high esteems yeah. Um, yeah, yeah still today even even back then so it had a very very kind of strong roots and you know all the people that involved in it especially Cartier Bresson you know they were they were highly qualified I know that um, Bresson he received honorary degrees I think it was from from Oxford University yeah. um, you know and he, he was you know he was quite well renowned across the world really especially in Europe but certainly across the world for for his work and um, but yeah I think he's one person that a lot of people will have heard of I imagine Yes, yeah, I think he's probably one of the most famous 20th century photographers, isn't he? Mm, yeah. And I think particularly if you're interested in documentary photography. And he always saw, saw himself as a documentary documentary photographer rather than a photojournalist. I think he was quite specific about that because he didn't go out looking for, for news stories. It was a very different way of working. It was the idea that you... Uh, you weren't looking for news you were just looking for what goes on around you you were just documenting a life basically weren't you and then yeah uh, which is which is ironic because as much as he was interested in everybody must well, say everybody else's life but the world around him he was very camera shy himself from from what i've read kind of oh, really? research that yeah, yeah when he when he actually received this honorary degree um from oxford university somebody wanted to take a photograph of him yeah. for, for purposes of, of records and he basically held the the paper or whatever it was certificate in front of his face so he, he wasn't being able to photograph he, <laughs> he just he just didn't like okay. the idea that he was he was being photographed for the benefit yeah. or for the notion that he was famous he didn't like the right. idea of celebrity of yeah, was, yeah yeah it yeah. was that like you said i mean it goes back to yeah. painting the camera black you know he liked that anonymity of yeah. what street photographers like and apparently there is one anecdote how how verifiable it is you know, we'll never know but cartier bresson believed that what went on beneath the surface of a person was nobody's business but its own but apparently he did recall that once he confided his innermost secrets to a paris taxi driver certain <laughs> certain that he would never meet the man again so yeah, yeah. Ta- taxi taxi cab okay. confessions i think that's, that's the original start <laughs> point of that but apparently yeah, yeah he was a very very private person he, he, he didn't really like to be known as a celebrity or influential photographer yeah no I thought I, well I think it's uh I think it's a good way to be really isn't it I mean it's your work that speaks for you isn't it yeah. I mean it's all there in the work really I think many uh, artists are like that I imagine yeah, they, they're, yeah, they're yeah. not it's as you say it's about it's what we put out as opposed yeah. to us yeah, ourselves yeah. really we're not it's not like sports although and- saying that yeah i mean the celebrity thing has become a bigger thing hasn't it these yeah. days it does seem to be more important that people are interested in in the people and the celebrities and that whole celebrity culture yeah. which is something we'll probably come on to sort of with a couple of the the later photographers that we talk about but you mentioned yeah. um uh ansel adams Yes, yeah. So he's very much the the kind of the next person I actually had on my list as well. Because right. um, so Ansel Adams, born February the twentieth, nineteen o two, lived kind of quite a fairly long life. He died in nineteen eighty four, so he was eighty two when he died. 
Um, so as, as many people will know, you know, you may kind of be quite familiar uh, with Ansel Adams and, and what he did. But for those that didn't, um, you know, he's an American photographer that pretty much specialized in black and white photography of, well, it's pretty much like the American Midwest, isn't it, really? Yeah, yeah. And it was, I mean, he's probably one of the most famous landscape photographers. Now. He works in black and white primarily. Uh, and we mentioned before he developed the zone system. So it was all about the reproducing uh, your landscape in in all the tones so you're using a complete tonal range from white to black but also to do with positioning the tones in the right place on your grayscale. yeah I mean I did I've, I've got his book on um, the printing and uh, the negative because he did a whole series of books that uh, on the on how to how to take your negatives how to de develop them how to expose them mm -hmm. very complicated I mean yeah. it's yeah <laughs> well, that, that kind was... of follows uh, in line with the, the the principles of Group F64 that, you know, yeah. everything was very, very, I don't say mechanized, but everything was, you know, highly scrutinized in terms of yeah. it being almost like yeah. a scientific process. But, you know, in oh, in knowing much. that and, and reading a little bit about him, that his upbringing, because uh, he was he was raised more so by his father, um, and he was very much, uh, his father kind of created the, the idea of a very mor a modest moral life guided by social responsibility to everything around him because he also was a bit of an environmental I say, yeah. activist, wasn't he? Yeah, well, he was very uh, interested in, in, in the untouched American wilderness, wasn't it? Yeah. So it was the national park, so he was very involved. I think he actually, uh, didn't he... Did, didn't he work within the national parks at one point as well when he was younger as well? So I think that's where he first got interested in in the landscape and, and recording yeah. and documenting the landscape when he I was younger. He, he went to Yosemite National Park in 1916 yeah. and, and wrote, uh, and quotes, the splendor of Yosemite burst upon us and it was glorious. One wonder after another descended upon us. There was light everywhere. A new era began for me. And then his his father had basically uh, bought him a camera. He bought him an Eastman Kodak Brownie, um, which basically he, he went off and, and took you know photographs yeah. with. And I think yeah. about a year or two after that initial trip to Yosemite, he went back himself on his own um, and basically just photographed everything he could and then yeah. taught himself <clears throat> darkroom yeah. techniques um, yeah. from, from there, really. Yeah, well, he was, again, he was an associate of uh, people like Imogen Cunningham and Edward Weston, who yeah. were part of the, F and he was part of F64 group as well. Uh, and his, I mean, the notes I've got, they favoured sharp focus and the use of the entire photographic grayscale from black to white, but shunned any effects borrowed from traditional fine arts like painting. So they were very much against those kind of arty photographers that had come before them mm -hmm. that used all these different techniques. Uh, but their idea was that you, that you use the relationship between exposure development, densities in the negative and all those kind of things. But... At the same time, they were quite, you know, they didn't want it to just be a technical thing because that would be too cold, wouldn't it? You know, you're just yeah. thinking it was technical reproducing a seed in front of it. But they, it was using that technology in an expressive way. Mm -hmm. to, so you, you visualized your photograph before you took it. So this was idea that, that when he went out to take a photograph in the landscape, he would try and visualize what was there in front of him, but as the print through the knowledge of the process mm. to gain a particular print. And you can kind of see that because when you look at his prints, you kind of think nothing ever looks like that. It does look like that, yeah. but he's kind of bringing something out of that landscape that he's kind of felt or, or, you know, when he was there that he wants to express in the photo. So it's not just a straight photograph of it. It no. has been, it has been manipulated in a sense, but it's been manipulated by his knowledge of the process. If you see what I mean. Well, it's kind that's of... it. he did experiment as well. He, he, he was, you know, still interested in pushing the boundaries still a little yeah. bit like, like yeah. the photographers that he, um, he played around with something called bro bromoil, bromoil process, yes. which is basically yeah. in a, um, for those listening, uh, a process involving an oily ink onto the paper, which yeah. that combined with the soft focus lens that he would use um, would try and give him that kind of mystical, kind of slightly magical glow of a sunny, af mm. sunny afternoon. Because I remember watching a program once about Adams and the one little thing I do remember, little anecdote about him that 
they were driving down the road and they stopped and he wanted to take this landscape um, and the moon was up in the sky and everything and he didn't have his light meter to hand that he knew literally only had like you know a minute or two to kind of capture the shot but he knew I don't know whether it was based upon the position of the moon or you know, where the moon was in terms of its cycle mm. but he knew the exact luminosity of the moon oh, which really? helped him effectively uh, inform what settings his camera needed to be at what exposure length it needed to be at to basically kind of get you know a decent level of exposure yeah. because he was he was that in tune with the surroundings the environment you know it's not just the, the scene as you say you know, yeah. the lighting yeah, became yeah. Uh, ever so important for him so yeah. yeah he was very much a stickler for for the the maths and the science i do it. think it's quite incredible to think that there were you know there were people out there photographers who could judge exposure just by looking at a scene that didn't use an exposure meter but could work out you know they could figure it out and think yeah this this should be shot at whatever yeah. and they could they could work this all out in their heads uh before it got anywhere near you know processing or darkroom or anything like that. so they knew exactly what what they were going to get at the end of it i mean i you know there's no way i could have ever done that i mean i tried and i i, <laughs> I, I read the books well it, it, i read the so, books but it was just so difficult anybody yeah. that's used a film camera before um will know how hard it is <clears> but the yeah. the beauty and i think if you if you've never grown up with film photography and you've only ever used digital and you've got exposure simulation on the back of your camera then yeah you've never literally had to work out the exposure um from scratch you know yeah. you can't look at a scene and go right what does this require whereas digital photography gives a lot of that away so i think it's it's hard to um and it's having all that information in in, in the negative i mean now yeah. if, if if you're shooting uh raw files you've got it all there pretty much haven't you yeah. whereas you know you're shooting at shooting on uh on negative film and then processing it so you've got to try and get everything as much as you can onto that negative detail wise and not overexpose or underexpose areas very very difficult to do that um because naturally it wouldn't it wouldn't cover the full exposure range so you have to find ways around it yeah. and there was one way that i used to work which was and i i can't remember it now but it was a particular way of developing uh, which i think you used a much weaker developer solution and you developed for longer and it gave you, you you could get more tones into your negative by doing it that way so it was yeah. it was a, it was a more long-winded process um and did you develop twice? I think there were two different developers. You pulled it out and then put another developer in. So I, I did try and use some of those techniques, yeah. uh, the more, the more you know, sort of obvious ones that you could just do. Uh, and there's the, the whole sort of the zone system, looking into the, the you know, the, the grayscale and, you know, doing contact strips properly and all that. Yeah. But it's a very long-winded process. I mean, honestly, people who work uh, digitally these days don't know how lucky they are to be able to. <laughs> but it did still carries on I, I noticed today oh, yeah. with the landscape photographers that certainly not maybe everybody but certainly you kind of quite a few that I know of um they they very much don't go out and kind of shoot you know 200 images you know per per shoot per outing they'll maybe go out and they'll shoot literally four five frames and they know yeah. if they've got the shot they'll walk yeah. away and they, they've got it they don't need to take any good way to do well. it yeah, yeah it certainly saves on the editing time but and also planning ahead going to places and then thinking well you know if we if we come back in certain weather conditions or when the sun's setting uh, over there rather than over there because it moves yeah. around and things like that. I think, you know, I think that's that's what really good landscape photographers do, isn't it? It's like, I'm not a landscape photographer, so it's, it's not so much my kind of thing, but I know people who do that and it's very much about planning ahead and waiting for the right weather or going somewhere and hoping that you'll get the right cloud formations when you want them. And so you have to have an awful lot of patience. It, you know, you kind of think with landscape, you just go out, take some photos, in a, you know, a pretty landscape and that's it. But it, yeah. no, there's an awful lot to it. And I think you need a lot of patience um, because you can't, you haven't, you're not in control of it, are you? I mean, in a studio with a still life, you've got full control of what you're yeah. doing. It's all down to you. And the same with portraits to some extent, That's depending it. on who you're working with and how awkward they are. But, um... <laughs> <laughs> but it, it is, it, it really is. You, you are quite literally shooting yeah. in the dark for a lot of the time when you're, when you're shooting on film yeah. and out yeah. on location. But, yeah. you know, he, he, he set many challenges for himself. I, I read that he was, um, 
that he got he got a number of fellowships from the Guggenheim Museum, um, and one of which was to basically go and photograph every national park in America. Um, I think this was kind of just post-war, maybe like 1945, 1946. Yeah. And he managed to get 20 um, to 27 of them. I think there's 28 national parks at the time. So there's one down in Florida, I think it was, that he never got round to. But he did try okay. and go around the country as much as he was quite, you know, his work in Yosemite Park was very much what he's, you know, he's known for. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He did travel around quite a bit. Well, and they're absolutely stunning images, though, aren't they? I mean, when you look at Ansel Adams, and it, the... the their particular way of photographing the landscape now that um, you almost take for granted because they're quite familiar. Like uh, the shot they picked out, where you've got all these boulders in the foreground and the light on them, and the mountains in the background, and the cloud formations. Mm. It's something that's been done over and over again, and you see it recurring in other people's images all the time now. But I would imagine at the time that was quite a you know a unique way. People hadn't really worked in that way before. Uh, so, you know, you can see that influence still, you know, to this day. Yeah. Uh, and I do think, again, we've, we've tried to pick out some of the more or the most influential photographers mm -hmm. uh, of the 20th century, mostly. I mean, there's a couple of more recent ones, I think. With, well, we'll there is to, kind of moving but... forwards from, uh, from Ansel Adams, I believe. Uh, well, two photographers maybe are kind of similar in respects to the, the interest of work and the, the years yeah. of work, you know, uh, Diane Arbus and Gary Winogrand. Um, so we're moving into like the, the in terms of like the, the main body yeah coming into the 60s now aren't we yeah yeah and street photography i guess i yeah, mean yeah. I, I don't know would you call diane arbor street photography or not it's... well yeah i suppose it's a, a little bit of a mixture there is there is kind of elements of our work that has that kind of street feel definitely gary winner yeah. and you know he, yeah 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 absolutely for that's yeah. his work but yeah i mean even just the, with the example image that we've got of um of diane arbor here the little boy um yeah. in this kind of yeah, yeah. Um, mixed up dungarees holding what yeah. is effectively a hand grenade isn't it <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's the toy hand grenade image it's, I, picked it out, I picked it out because uh, it's always made me laugh. And uh, although her image, I mean, her images can be quite sort of difficult and quite disturbing because, I mean, what she wanted to do was to go out and photograph. She said help, her, her imagery helped marginalise groups and mar marginalised groups and people that weren't normally represented you know, represented in photography. So she photographed strippers, carnival performers, mm -hmm. nudists, people with dwarfism, all sorts of people uh, from different walks of life, but out in the street, but yeah. in familiar settings out in the street or in their homes, well, in the workplace, in the to, park. But um, she liked to get to know them as well. So she didn't, yeah. I think with Gary Winogrand, he was much more, he just went out and like took photographs of what was going on in the street. Uh, they're yeah. quite anonymous, aren't they? Whereas with her, she she was very much interested in the people she was photographing and their stories. And apparently the boy in the photograph with the, uh, she caught him at a moment of exasperation. So it's called Child with Toy Hand Grenade in Central Park, New York City, 1962. But I always think of it as being the, the exasperated child for some reason. <laughs> that's that's always the title that, that comes into my head. <laughs> but yeah, but, um, it's, it's interesting it, because there is like... Um, a, a parallel between the two of them in some respects, um, but yeah. certainly a disconnect in the sense that she, yeah. like you said, she very much got to know her characters, let's say, or subject. Yeah. Whereas Winogrand, I mean, even some people refer to him as a bully uh, in, in the terms oh, of really? how, how yeah. he approached his work. That yeah. He was very much, you know, quite an in-your-face type of street shooter, but he wanted sure. that reaction. He wanted yeah. the grit and, you yeah. know, the seriousness yeah. and kind of the, the chaos of what life was like in a big yeah. metropolis, yeah, yeah. really, because we've not seen yeah. that up until now. People actually photographing it in the big cities a lot of the time it has been yeah. individuals still life landscapes etc so now we're, we're moving with the times as biz as um, towns and cities yeah. are getting bigger you know photographers are literally finding themselves yeah. in this kind of yeah. smorgasbord of, of personalities and characters and i i think that's where the two of them both have parallels that they do find yeah individual yeah, yeah people but they have a difference in how they photograph them um there's a lot of empathy in Diane Arbus's photos. I mean, some people look at them and see them as being exploitative and thinking, oh, she's just photographing freaky looking people, you know, and, uh, and or unhappy looking people and that they're, they're kind of, she's presenting them in a kind of making them look ugly or making them look unhappy and that it's quite exploitative, but it isn't because she was really concerned with who they were and why they were doing it. Like this child who apparently his parents were going through a divorce 
divorce and he was feeling this sense of being abandoned at the time and was just, she just found him out there sort of looking completely distraught because of what was going on in his life and she captured that in that image but did you also know that uh she uh you know the film The Shining, Stanley yeah. Kubrick's film The Shining. You know the twins in The Shining. Are they her children? Uh, no, no. But oh, right. that that <laughs> the idea of the twins in The Shining came from one of her photos because oh, right. a guy that was working on the film, I think uh, he he was really interested in Diane Arbus's uh, photography mm. and the identical twin girls that appeared in Kubrick film they weren't in the original script they weren't part of the film but it was this okay. guy's suggestion and he showed Stanley Kubrick the photo of the t- of uh, two identical twins which uh, I'd, I'd never made that connection. I knew, I'd, I'd seen the photo. I knew the photo. It's a really famous photo of two yeah. twin girls. And obviously I know, you know, the film, The Shining, it's one of my favourite films. Uh, mm-hmm. I'd never made that connection, but apparently that's that's where the idea of the two characters, the, the twins in The Shining came from. So, you, you know, you can see Diane Arbus's influence on popular culture in a completely yeah. different way then, that her imagery has kind of come into such a sort of, you know, iconic film and the mm. imagery in that film. And I know loads of people who've been to fancy dress parties dressed up as the two <laughs> twins from The Shining who That's were then crazy. based on the two twins in the Diane Arbus photo. And, and most of those people would have no idea that it's they have a connection to Diane Arbus there as well. So mm. I thought that was a really interesting sort of flow of, uh, you know, how things influence and connect in well, yeah. you know in our in our culture really in popular culture well as you say it's it's trans it's transgressing isn't it you know yeah. from one, yeah, one yeah. medium to another really and yeah. I'm, I'm sure there's yeah. many other examples yeah. of it but I, I think it's it's great that yeah it's you know that photography was being looked at in other areas as you say you know filmmakers were taking inspiration from photographers as photographers had taken inspiration from painters um yeah. you know and storytellers yeah. when we were talking you know 100 years back with you know Julia Margaret Cameron, she was taking inspiration from the work of um, uh, Lewis Carroll to, to kind yeah, of create yeah, characters, yeah, etc. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. you know, photography is very much, you know, borrowed, ideas are borrowed across mediums, yeah. you know, all the yeah, time, really, yeah, yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. But, and um, recycled. But yeah. it's interesting um, with Gary Wienergrand's work, because I've got a quote by him which I really liked as well where he says photography is not about the thing photographed, it's about how that thing looks photographed which I thought was a really interesting quote mm. and way of seeing things. So it's, it's not about the thing, it's about how the thing looks. But you kind of think, is that how Diane Arbus did it? Or, you know, is she more concerned with the actual thing? I mean, he, yeah. he calls it a thing. Would she well, call it a person yeah. rather than a thing? And he seems to be more interested in how, how that looks in the photo. So it sounds quite superficial. But, it's very much a disassociative approach yeah, that you yeah, don't yeah. you don't gel with your subject. You don't, as you say, you don't even refer to them as a person if it is a person. And he, he did shoot a lot of uh, street photography, so there's a lot of people in it. Yeah, but the yeah, fact yeah. that he sees them as as objects, you know, the muses, they're not yeah. maybe real people to them. It's yeah, it's yeah, a different yeah, different yeah. mindset, really. It's, it's yes, interesting. yeah, and so sort of this idea of. Um, the, the banality of everyday life, you know, but you can you can create something interesting out of that. So, you know, so subjects that most people would have just ignored in the past suddenly become important. Uh, and I think you can see that in a lot of late 20th century photography where people start photographing things in ways that don't look particularly arty or, or just snapshots, you know, like the way Andy Warhol did all those Polaroids. They're just, you know, everybody else would look at them and just think, oh, they're just snapshots. There's nothing yeah. special about them. But for him, that was part of his art. So yeah. there's a very different approach with photography. So it's, again, moving away from being arty and perfect. And when you look at a lot of street photography, quite often the, you know, you can relate it to Cartier-Bresson in some ways, but in other ways, they're very almost kind of you know you look at the you kind of think 
did they compose it like that on purpose or mm. did that composition just happen randomly? You know, this idea that you could just like, like put it, point your camera up in the air, hold it up like that, take a photograph and see what happens. Yeah. And I think that that's, that's equally valid. I don't see anything wrong with doing that. I mean, some people say, Oh, you, you know, you haven't actually done that yourself. It's just a random photo. Yeah. But then if it looks good, like he says, it's about how that thing looks, you well, know, so that works a, as well. It's pointing your camera in the right direction at the right time or provoking yeah the right response i think there's there is an artistic uh, quality to that and there is yeah, artistic yeah, yeah. um you know benefits to it really which very much like the next two people i think we were going to go on to talk about yeah. um, don mccullen and steve mccurry they were very much given their their areas of expertise be it um documentary photography more photographers some more um that they very much had to be in the right place at the right time they would never have had the opportunity to somewhat pose an image to a large degree but they knew yeah. about you know where to put the camera and at the right time and you know and what moments potentially were going to be happening really so um so yeah um did you have any notes about don mccullen well don mccullen is a, a very very brave person i would say to start with i mean to to go where he went and take the photographs that he did um just just mind-blowing really i mean because he went through all sorts uh he you know spent two years two two not two years two decades in all the sort of worst places the wars in the congo uganda vietnam cambodia like the whole list of every iran afghanistan northern ireland just documenting you know some of the worst things that ever happened in the 20th century really mm. i mean okay apart from the second world war but sort of later on you kind of think it was still going on everywhere else i mean we kind of think oh you had the first world war second world war but then it was continuing really wasn't yeah. it i don't think it ever ended it, just in different parts of the world yeah and <laughs> his uh he was i don't know he i think he was arrested and sort of blown up and so many things happened and i picked out this one particular image where he actually describes it and he said I, I was in a small town near Phnom Penh and it was in the evening and we walked into an ambush a mortar bomb dropped in front of the jeep and I got all the metal that came underneath it got me in my legs and my crotch so he was blown up basically and it killed the man who was sitting in front of him he got the whole lot in the stomach then they put me on the truck to take me to hospital. And I felt, why sit here doing nothing? Why not take pictures to take my mind off it? So, <laughs> so he's there on the way to hospital, potentially about to die, just having been blown up in a Jeep, seeing other people die around him. And he's still focused on taking photographs. I've got what, I mean, how anybody goes through that. I think in the end he had to stop, didn't he? Cause it, I think he had a breakdown or something and it all just got too much and he couldn't. I, I'm not surprised. And no, then I'm... I think he just started taking landscapes, didn't he? I think his later work was of landscape. He just retired to the English countryside or something. I, I think there's just... very much, um, you know, it's not, not the first, person to, you know, you know, to be affected by their work yeah. really you know even photographers like uh, Kevin yeah. Carter um, yeah. you know, the work that he yeah. did um, kind of in, in the 80s 90s uh, but he says of... photography for me is not looking it's feeling and if you can't feel what you're looking at then you're never going to get others to feel anything when they look at your pictures mm. and I think that Obviously, you know, seeing what, what he photographed, you do get a very strong feeling from that because of the subject matter a lot of the time. But I think it applies equally to all types of photography is, is that if you're trying to communicate something, you're communicating a feeling or expressing something, you need to feel it as well. And if you're not feeling it, then you're not likely to actually capture that in your images and express yeah. it to somebody else yeah i think i think you're right especially with something like you know war photography any kind of street yeah. photography like yeah, yeah. Got, there's got yeah. to be emotion there's got to be a, a you know some type of connection yeah. between the audience yeah. who can get it and the the image itself otherwise it, it's just not relatable you know yeah. and, and not yeah, every yeah. image is going to be like that but especially when you're putting you know people in the frame instinctively yeah. humans are going to want to look at humans in a photograph you know and it, again it it's it, it's there was an era wasn't there i mean i guess with when he had all those um like national geographic magazine and time magazine and the color supplements and that's where people got their information from and, and they got it visually and that was really important so that kind of photography reached a very wide audience and i think uh I, i'm not sure you know how much influence don mccullen would have had on 
things like the anti-Vietnam protests and things like that. But I would imagine these photographers were going out there. They, they, they weren't going out there because they wanted to have a great time. They, 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 were, they were obviously dedicated to showing the rest of the world what was going on in these places. Yeah, well, and I would that... imagine they'd be very much anti what was going on in those places to want to do that. And it's a very difficult thing to do. I mean, I, the only time I've actually done any documentary work myself really was uh years ago i got um asked to go along with a it was uh a project in uganda uh and it was uh to do it was with two rappers i don't know if you remember they're called the cookie crew who were two british girl heard rappers of i've heard of the name Maybe they went the out. Cutting crew. No, yeah, no. The, so <laughs> no, but they they got asked to go out and do uh, a tour in Uganda and Kenya. Uh, but the tour, it was the idea of using music to educate people about AIDS because at the time yeah. it was during the the AIDS outbreak in Africa, which was like 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 a major 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 problem, and they were really struggling with it. It was about educating people through music and thinking that they could reach young people through music. And I just went along as a photographer to document that 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 particular project. But uh, at one point, I got asked to go in and photograph. Um, it was a hospital uh, full of AIDS patients in uh, Kampala in Uganda, and I I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. I just had to walk out. I said, look, I can't do this. I can't photograph these people. It just seems to me, it seemed too exploitative. Yeah. And it was, um, yeah, I, I, it, that's when I sort of thought, no, some people, there's some people, obviously they can do this kind of work, but I'm not that person. It, it, it's a yeah. really, really hard thing to do to photograph people in such terrible conditions in suffering so much. And I just couldn't do it. There I, is, I, there has been great benefit from it. I think you were going to say yeah. like, the, you know, Don McCullen, and even though they were yeah. ne maybe necessarily yeah. going out there for, yeah, no, no not personal exploits, but between yeah. him, yeah, yeah. people like Don McCullen, uh, sorry, Don McCullen, and Steve McCurry, um, Kevin Carter, who I mentioned before, and yeah, the people that yeah. he worked with as well, which yeah. I think they adopted the name or the moniker, the, the Bang Bang Club. A lot of these yeah. people who photographed during um, the Afghan war, I think Steve McCurry, yeah. that, that yeah, was yeah. one of his kind of I'd say highlights of his career or thing he was very notable for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don McCullough in the Vietnam War. Um, I think um, Kevin Carter covered a lot of the South yeah, African yeah, apartheid yeah. issues. Um, but yeah, they were willing to put themselves in such situations and literally Literally, the last thought is of their own health and safety. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but the image and the story to be able to then pass back on to the world for people to actually realize and yeah, see what yeah, was yeah. happening because you couldn't always get a video camera, you know, a video camera, you know, a film crew in these situations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But a camera was smaller, it was discreeter, it was easier to use. Um, and it was very much telling people about, like you said, the continuing wars yeah, that were going on. Yeah, the the, yeah, the yeah. end of the Second World War was not the end of, you know, it wasn't just peacetime yeah. then after that. So I think these people are, as you say, extremely brave, but yeah. you've got to have not only a strong stomach, um, but you've got to be able to kind of slightly, slightly dis disconnect yourself from the yeah, situation, but also that's be what I found difficult to do. It, it, you know, you've, I think you have to dis dissociate yourself from it. So yeah. although he talks about, you know, you've got to feel it. But there must be a certain point where you where you have to stop feeling because it would just get too much in those sort yeah. of situations. Um, and I think it, it it's obviously takes a great strain on your mental health. And mm. I would imagine, like, so you burn out very quickly doing that kind of work. Mm. And um, well, he was pretty much from what I read about Don McCullen, he yeah. was pretty much born into a in the war situation he was born yeah, in 1935 yeah, yeah. so kind of yeah. you know, as he was growing up i think he was actually evacuated yeah. out to somerset um as a child during the blitz in yeah. london and th and that's where yeah. he stayed you know obviously he traveled the world etc but that's where he his roots were in the end as well he like, lived out in somerset and that's where he kind of uh, served the rest uh, spent the rest of his life but you don't i mean i don't know if it's me that i just don't look at the right places but you don't seem to see you know what you call war photography anymore do you i don't think online it, no it's... i think a lot of it's very highly 
Um, not propaganda so much. I don't, I don't think you're so allowed much. to do it. I yeah, think this I is one say, of the things. You I just cannot so do it anymore. You don't Health and safety. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody has access to those places. They won't allow photographers. And I think Don McCullen said that you, you don't, photographers aren't allowed to go into the front line anymore, whereas he could just go right into the thick of it. Yeah. Um, but whereas now it's impossible to do that. So well, there, he, there he isn't was, anybody documenting it anymore. He was stopped. Um, this was it. Um, <laughs> at the height of the Falklands War, yeah. he actually asked the government at the time for a pass for him to basically go to the Falklands and document it. Oh, really? And it was refused by um, oh, okay. the Conservative government at the time because they felt that his images would be too revealing, too disturbing, et cetera. And yeah. then after that, yeah. he basically just kind of put a can on it. He said, right, I'm not going to go and do it anymore. And as you said, he, he turned to yeah. uh, landscape yeah, yeah. photography because, yeah, if he wasn't allowed to express himself, if he was sure. going to be used yeah. for propaganda yeah, yeah. purposes or his yeah. images were going to be yeah. um, muted in some way or censored, then he's like, well, there's, there's no point to it at all you're, you're totally right yeah 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 well that's it i mean photography is a very strong tool for propaganda as well so i guess if you're an official photographer for the government or something like that then you're put in this position where you've got to take photographs that they want and i mean you've got extremes of it like you had in in nazi germany with uh what's the name lenny reefen style doing this at, of the, the photography for, for the nazi party and those films triumph of the will brilliant photographer but very you know dubious kind of you know in terms of her affiliation with the nazi party which kind of affected her for the rest of her life because nobody was ever going to forget that yeah uh even though she was an amazing photographer and, and developed some very sort of unique ways of filming and things like that. I think she, she sort of developed that way of uh, putting a camera on wheels, isn't it? On tracks and things like that, yeah. that, that became popular uh, in, 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 you know, sort of modern filmmaking, but yeah, you've, you'd have to be very careful because it's also then how your, how your photos are presented and what they're used for uh, politically as well. So I guess being a photographer in that situation could be quite tricky, you know, politically as well in feeling that your photography is being used for the right purposes. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And it, yeah, it's, it, it's not, and it, I, I, I've always thought that would be a very difficult area to get into because I'd find it very difficult to, you know, be expected to take photographs for political purposes or, yeah. you know, to be used in a certain way. It's bad enough when your photographs are being used sort of in ways <laughs> that you don't know anyway. When well, you that's it. Them. That's the, unfortunately the, the, yeah. the habit of the internet these days. But as a, yeah. as a little footnote to Don McCullen, the last little note I had about him, and I don't know yeah. where it's up to in terms of production, but apparently in November 2020, it was announced that Angelina Jolie was going to be directing a biopic about McCullen. Um, oh, really? Harry, oh. Supposedly at okay. the time they had Tom Hart, Tom Hardy starring as uh, yeah. as McCullen. I don't know where yeah. it's up to, but it's 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 basically kind of uh, an abridged adaptation yeah. from his autobiography or a biography that's been written about him. Uh, that's but I, I don't know where it's up to. I don't know what title they're working to or anything like that. Yeah. But that was what was about eight, mm, eighteen months ago, kind of a year and a bit ago, um, when that was announced. So um, yeah. it'd be interesting to follow up on. Oh, definitely, yeah, because that yeah, I could imagine that would make a pretty. Uh, gripping film if I you imagine know. so yeah, yeah so was there any other photographers that you wanted to mention i think we're kind of coming towards well, the close of yeah our, uh, of our there's search. so many i mean there's <laughs> so, many. There's so many hours <laughs> many i mean we we, we looked at uh, you know briefly at steve mccurry that that famous photograph an afghan girl a very it different very different i mean he he's very much of the national geographic so, of color photos of mm -hmm. uh, people in uh, India and, and uh, uh, you know, sort of those colorful pictures that, that now you kind of think, you kind of take that sort of photography for granted, that, that sort of National Geographic style photography uh, of people in different countries that, yeah. Uh, bright colors um and that that picture of the afghan girls very fame became very famous doesn't it you've seen it over and over and over and over yeah. again uh and so we just wanted to bring that in a uh, color photography because most of what we've talked about has been black and white hasn't it it has and i'm actually looking at the next kind of four images yeah. that you provided and they they all work on a yeah. similar line in terms of portrait photographers be it yeah. um annie yeah. lebovitz nick knight cindy yeah. sherman and bruce yeah, gilden yeah. Um, but yeah, they, they are, you know, very much exploiting and, the benefits of yeah. color and boldness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And very quickly before that, I mean, one of the first color photographers to work in color was a portrait photographer called Madame Yvonne in the 1930s, was a yeah. society portrait photographer. And she worked with 
what is known as a VVEX process where you took three different negatives at the same time. And I think it was four actually, because you took a black and white one as well. So you took them through different color filters and then printed them registered with different color layers to create the film, to create your image, which is pretty much the same way that um, Kodachrome worked, I think, yeah. but it was a patented process called VVEX that she used. Uh, if anybody's interested in, and her prints look amazing. I've seen some of her original prints and the colors in them are absolutely they're just beautiful um she she again a bit like julia margaret cameron she dressed um she worked she, she kind of photographed posh people basically yeah. i guess she made a lot of money through photographing very posh people in fancy dress <laughs> which seems totally superficial uh which i'm sure it was but they obviously had a lot of fun doing it and she made a lot of money out of it and she's now become uh, quite iconic for some of those images that she took back in the 30s. she was kind of forgotten about disregarded for years because it was like oh they're just pictures of posh people aren't they whereas you kind of think now in retrospect you can take that forward and you've got people like um Annie Leibovitz again she's taking pictures of famous people it's like celebrity photos I mean these were Madame Yvonne's were celebrity photos of society people in the 1930s and then you've got Annie Leibovitz as her celebrity photos of uh you know film stars actresses yeah. you know um in you know 90s i mean she started off photographing for was it rolling stone i think i think uh, she yeah, she's done a few yeah she's done a few covers she certainly does work with um well, she's photographed a lot of musicians before as one yeah. of them yeah yeah uh, she's photographed i think she did the wedding for was it beyonce i think it was i, I did know, see. a very kind of recent one but oh then and also- she did that really famous photo of john lennon and yoko Ono, the naked yeah. one on the bed didn't she that's that's one of her most famous images and demi moore's I mean, we're all used to seeing uh, maternity photos these days, aren't we? It's become yeah. a thing, which I never used to be. When I, was, when I started photography, I don't think I ever saw anybody doing maternity. You got wedding photography, yeah. you didn't get maternity photos. Whereas now it seems to be part of this whole process of having a family, isn't it? You, you get everything yeah. documented. You have your wedding photos, you have your maternity shots, you have the baby shots, you have that, that whole sort of thing going on. And I think that, that picture of Demi Moore on the front of, was it, uh, which magazine was it on? I can't remember now, but uh, Vanity Fair, wasn't it? It was a Vanity yeah, Fair co- and, yeah. cover of naked, very pregnant Demi Moore, which was very controversial at the time. But now you look at it and you think, well, everybody's having photos done like that. Well, this is it. And, you know, these four people, uh, Annie Labovitz, Nick Knight, Cindy Sherman and Bruce Gilden, they they very much all photograph people but it's all celebrating different types of people. oh very different and, and, yeah. and it's and it's looking yeah. at them as you say you know, it goes back to literally the very start of this podcast yeah. where we're talking about yeah, yeah. people sitting still for a number of minutes this is now just capturing people on the hoof it doesn't yeah. matter you know you know bruce gilden for example he he literally went out on almost sought after the the waifs and strays of life you know the people yeah. that maybe didn't yeah. fit in yeah. society yeah. to a large yeah. degree yeah. Yeah. Um, whereas you know annie levovitz may look at that and say the higher end you know not necessarily high society but the celebrities cindy sherman yeah. and nick knight somewhere fit in between in terms of well, the abstract approaches yeah i mean nick knight was a very influential photographer of fashion in yeah. i guess the 80s and 90s when he first came to prominence i know when i was when i was at college studying in the early 90s he was the photographer that everybody was into it's like oh have you seen the latest copy of face or id with the you know the latest nick knight photos in it that's what yeah. everybody wanted to do do it was like and and he'd been to um Bournemouth and Pool, I think college there which is where he studied and there's this big rivalry between that that one and, and me where I was at Blackpool Blackpool and the file they were the two sort of rival colleges it's like oh so you've been to Bournemouth you know it's a little bit like you know uh yeah there was a lot of a lot of that going on uh and this idea that um you can make huge amounts of money by being a photographer which uh, rapidly sort of evaporated after you left college and you realized that you couldn't no you had to be true. very very lucky and uh know the right people because i knew somebody who uh actually got into photography without studying but was his parents knew patrick litchfield mm. and he got a job just assisting Patrick Litchfield and then went off to be a big, big name photographer uh, working for American Vogue and things like that. Yeah. A few years later, 
and it was there, and there was me, you know, sort of going to Blackpool and studying properly and all the rest of it. There's nothing it's wrong like, with Blackpool. <laughs> yeah, Blackpool. and it was like, oh, it's not fair, you know. He's gone off to be this <laughs> hugely famous photographer. Like you say, it's it's uh, who you know a lot of the time. I mean, he's yeah. a good. He is a really good photographer. Um, what's that? Andrew McPherson, uh, and he's again, he's photographer. He's taken photos of a lot of celebrities and you know done the same kind of thing as Andy Leibovitz has really mm. it's like and, and a lot of it you kind of think it is who you know meeting the right people at the right time but or, but but being very good as well I mean Andy, Andy Leibovitz is an extraordinary photographer I, I, it's not my kind of photography uh, but I can appreciate what she does she makes people look she makes people look powerful I think she makes them look famous in their photos. Yeah. I think if you weren't famous and you were photographed by Annie Leibovitz, you'd suddenly become famous because you were photographed by her almost. It's well, that's like it. The two yeah, things, you're almost they famous. They feed off proxy. each other, don't they? Yeah, 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 yeah. Whereas Cindy Sherman plays around with that whole idea of, you know, she just photographs herself. She's just been taking selfies for years, but she plays around with the way you present yourself and, and the idea of uh, identity. And, she, you know, she looks at celebrity photos and different photos. She did that whole series, the most recent series, where all her photographs were done on Instagram using Instagram filters and things that were available on your phone and all created right. all these extraordinary weird looking images of herself yeah. are all sort of like mutated uh, sort of like I, th I think the one that I picked out uh, it, it, they're just they're just funny I mean I, I, I like them because they're funny they make me laugh when I look at them I think wow you know they, how, yeah, they are quite radical. how on earth did he come up with that <laughs> You know, where did that come from? That, that, that is exploiting, you know, the, the, the tools that you have around yeah. you, which all yeah, photographers yeah. that we've been yeah. talking about on this show have done, yeah. whether it's in yeah. a dark room, whether it's on Instagram, yeah. you know, and that yeah. is the beauty of photography, really. Yeah. But yeah. Um, but I think we've pretty much capped everything that we were going to go through then, Nick. And uh, my yeah. webcam is pretty much almost at the end of its battery here. <laughs> so, right. okay. so I, or at some point we can continue talking, but no one will yeah. be able to see yeah, me yeah. further as well. But um, but I think it's been a, a fantastic discussion anyway, because we've covered like nearly 200 years of, of influential yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and iconic photographers. And oh, gosh, I've just seen the time. I, don't know. <laughs> I didn't realize we'd gone on for that long. Wow. It's been a while. And hopefully you, you've enjoyed yeah. it. You know, if you've been listening, you've been watching, it's been kind of something that's been very, very interesting to, to kind of listen yeah. to or watch through as well. And hopefully you've you've understood a little bit more about some of the people that we've been talking about in our previous episodes. Um, and, and also maybe some people that you've never heard of before, but now that you may be a bit more inspired. And as Nick said before, go and check out their work. Um, yeah, they'll yeah, yeah, have definitely. websites, won't they? So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's all. I mean, everything's online now, so it's so easy to to Google people and and just do image searches, and you see yeah. so much stuff there. And I, you know, definitely go and look at images as well. I mean, it's you know, take take images, but look at images and look at other people's work, and don't think you just have to look at stuff that people are doing now. Go back and look over yeah. images that have been done in the past as well. There's so much there. There's so much material there, and don't be afraid to you know, sort of be influenced by people or copy people. It doesn't matter. You, yeah. you know, you'll bring something of yourself to it as well. I mean, that's what I always yeah. think. If you if you see something you like, think, oh, I could do something like that and then go out and have a go at doing it because exactly. you'll learn something from we, doing we've it. We've talked so much about how a lot of these photographers yeah. we spoke about have collaborated and, and you know, borrowed ideas, etc. Yes. So it's not yeah, a foreign yeah. thing and it's not a bad thing. You know, you, you can be inspired by somebody else. That is absolutely oh, yeah, not a problem absolutely. as well. But, um, but thank you very, very much for listening and watching um, either way, whichever wherever you've caught our podcast show and if you've been listening to us on apple podcast i'll keep saying if you're able to leave us a review and a little rating it really really helps us out and obviously if you've been watching us on youtube if you have to give us a good old thumbs up turn the notifications on and give us a subscribe all those little things that um that help on the youtube algorithm we'd be much appreciated and um, but we'll be back next week with another show um this is the end of our little mini series about the history of photography so we're going to go into something totally different next week so if you kind of catch uh, catch that um i hope to to see you on the next episode but in the meantime nick it's been absolutely brilliant we've spent probably what about three four hours now across these these like yeah, series yeah. talking about history of photography and i've learned so much as much as i researched a lot of notes beforehand i've learned so much from you so 
thank you so much for good. all your input and i i hope you've enjoyed it and maybe we'll we'll hook up and we'll do another series in the future sometime soon no it's been great i've really enjoyed it because it's something i you know personally really like talking about and looking at and i don't often get a chance to do it because i'm not you know sort of teaching in a, a college anymore which is when i used to be able to sort of uh, ramble on at people about all the things that <laughs> things that i liked so uh, this yeah, has been your virtual be classroom again. in a way yeah. this is your yeah. lecture oh, studio <laughs> totally totally brilliant well thank you very very much for listening and watching anyway Thanks, yeah. and we'll catch you on the next show so see you soon bye-bye for now okay. bye bye